urinary catheters. Catheters, um, it's not going to be that long. <laughs> um, so I'm starting off being inappropriate near your um, They're huge vascular catheters, meaning they go up into the vessels, and we use them now a lot for clots. And when you guys asked me to do a little bit of um, science and te technology, I was originally going to talk a little bit about my own lab research. So I'm a neuroscientist, and I do basic biology and um, uh, ischemia research and stroke research in the lab using animal models. But it was kind of boring. So I decided to talk a little bit about stroke and how the brain is organized. And also looking at some of these devices that we use because they are kind of a feat of engineering. Um, the new devices that we use have really changed the way we treat stroke. So up until 1996, we had no treatments for stroke. Very little. Take an aspirin, sorry, go to rehab. Then we introduced a drug called TPA, which is a clot buster, and that breaks up clots. And stroke is really, most of the time, about 85% of the time, a clot in a blood vessel. So you want to break up that clot. So we started giving this clot buster, and the number needed to treat to get benefit is about 40. So you need to treat 40 patients to get one to have a big benefit, but it's a little risky. About 6% of patients can bleed, and they can bleed in the brain. And when that happens, that can be fatal. Last, so until 19, from 1996 to about, about two years ago, that's all we had. Then last year, we had five trials to use these devices. I brought a few of them today to show you to suck out clots or to pull out clots. And the number needed to treat is three. And so not everybody is eligible for these treatments, but I'll show you a few of those. And then it's really been a marvel of engineering how these devices have kind of morphed over the past 10 years. Because the first ones we were using, they worked, but they didn't work great. Um, and we were about to abandon them, and um, the people at Medtronic and uh, all these other companies really put a lot of thought and effort into making a catheter that was really soft and wouldn't puncture vessels. So anyway, that's what we're going to talk about. So the first thing I want you to kind of understand, and I'm a wanderer, so I'll probably, but I'm really loud, so you'll hear me anyway. Um, so there's really three different types of stroke. Um, we have intracranial hemorrhage. That's bleeding inside the brain. So here's a CAT scan. This is just an image, an x-ray image of your brain. And here, see this white stuff? That's bone. That's skull, okay? So things that are bright on a CAT scan are bone and blood. So about 15% of strokes, usually related to high blood pressure, are hemorrhages. So do you see this? Very not normal. So all that white stuff inside your skull is bleeding into the brain. And the problem with this is the brain is a closed bony vault, right? So if you put stuff in there, blood, the rest of the brain gets smushed. Okay? So this is often fatal. This type of stroke, this bleeding stroke, is actually much worse than the clot stroke, the ischemic stroke. So this is called an intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. So big, all this white stuff. Now I'm going to give you a quiz later. So what's white on um, calcium? Blood and bone, right? Calcium, really. Because it's just an x-ray. Now this is a different type of stroke and something we can also treat. Now that's called the subarachnoid hemorrhage. And unlike this where you see the blood inside the brain, you see the blood on the surface of the brain. And I brought some rat and mouse brains. That's called the circle of Willis. And that's usually from an aneurysm. And I'll show you some pictures of that. This is the most common type of stroke. This is called an ischemic stroke. And this is when a blood vessel has a clot and is blocked. So do you guys see anything abnormal? Does one side look different than the other side? Has a white dot. So these dots right here, so what is white on CAT scan? Blood and bone. Calcium. So this is actually calcium in the brain. We all have a little calcium in the brain. So it's the same thing as this. So that's normal. Do you see this? That's the stroke. That is a big, what we call left middle cerebral artery stroke. So see it's kind of hypodense? This is all dead brain. So if somebody came into the ER with this stroke, I couldn't give them a clot buster, because what would they do? They'd do this. They'd bleed into this dead brain. There's nothing left to salvage. The best CT you can see in a ischemic stroke is a normal CT, because it tells you the brain's still alive. 
Okay? So this is a big stroke, and this is all dead brain here. It's called the left MCA stroke. And this is by far the most common cause of stroke. And these are the ones we're going to really kind of talk about tonight. Now, this is a little neuroanatomy 101. So, the students and the residents and EMS, and whenever I give a talk, they're like, why do I care? Why do I care what symptoms go with what area of birth? You know, I'm not a neuron, not a person, I don't care. This is really, really important now in the era of stroke. So I'll show you some catheters where we go up into a vessel. The vessel has to be pretty big to get a catheter in it, a carotid or a middle cerebral artery. So we need to figure out, does the patient have symptoms of that big stroke? So you need to understand what the symptoms of stroke are. The, there's really, the ones you really need to know are, the, the mnemonic you should know is act fast, right? This is the ones you want to talk to your kids about and the high schoolers, act fast. Face, arm, speech, time. Drooping of the face, okay? Arm weakness, S is speech, Slurred speech or trouble understanding speech, and those are two very different things, and I'll explain why. And time, because we're up against the clock. Because you saw that dusk area of dead brain, I can't save it. So I need to know when the stroke started. When is the last time you saw your mom normal? When could she last talk? So face, arm, speech, time, act fast. So that's the mnemonic you can kind of have people remember. But we're better than that, right? You guys are teachers, you understand biology, chemistry. So what we now have to figure out is, is it a little vessel stroke that we would give the clock buster to, but we're not going to take them to the cath lab. I'm not going to call in all my nurses and say, come on into the cath lab. Let's try and take this big clot out if they don't have a big clot. So how can I tell? The S in speech is important. So there's two types of speech problems in stroke. One is slurred speech. That's dysarthria. That is but if you say, show me two fingers with your right hand, they understand exactly what you're saying. That's dysarthria. That's usually a small vessel. And you can get dysarthria from lots of different things, right? You can be drunk and you'll be dysarthric. I'm not saying any, no judgment here. Uh, you can have trouble, get trouble with your vocal cord, right? And be dysarthric. Right? So just isolated slurred speech is often like an intoxication or drug use or something. But if you see it with a drooping arm, they're not you know, on one side. So I always say, remember the F word, not just fast. F, the F word, not the, not the bad F word. The F word, focal. If you have a stroke <coughs> on one side of the brain, you're going to have symptoms on the other side of the body. So that's a focal finding, meaning one area of the brain is disrupted because it's not getting enough blood flow, it's not getting enough oxygen, it's dying. I'm going to get left arm weakness. I'm not going to get both arms being weak. That would be unusual, right? So stroke is usually focal. One area of the body, one area of the brain. So dysarthria is slurred speech. The other type of speech that's often, even now, we had a case in Sugarland a couple days ago, wasn't recognized by the ER, which blows my mind, um, is uh, aphasia. Do you guys know what aphasia is? Not being able to name something. So it's difficulty with language. So it's they might have very clear speech, but you say to them, what's your name? I, 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 and they can't get the word out. That's basically an expressive aphasia. So you say, what's your name? How old are you? And they look at you and they're mute, okay? The other type of aphasia is further back in the brain. That's receptive aphasia. That means you don't understand what I'm saying. So if somebody has a total aphasia, they come in and you say, what's your name? Exactly, so nonsensical speech. They can produce speech, but it makes no sense. That's called the receptive aphasia. So when you ask somebody with an expressive aphasia, the trouble with word finding, show me two fingers, they do it because they understand what you're saying, but they can't produce speech. If you also have the receptive speech, which in that big stroke I showed you, they have a global aphasia, meaning they produce no speech, and you say, show me two fingers, and they look at you. Show me two fingers. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. And they don't do it. Because it's basically, I like to tell people, it's like, I took you and put you in China. Do you speak Chinese? Okay, so if somebody's talking to you, blah, 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 you have no idea. Show me two fingers, blah, 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 blah. You're like nodding, you know they're talking to you, but you have no idea what they're saying. If I give you a newspaper, it's in Chinese. Can you read it? No. 
can you say to me, I don't understand what you're saying? No, because you don't speak Chinese. So that's aphasia, okay? That's trouble with language, not trouble with speech. And it's important because the way the brain is set up, it's all set up very kind of nicely. The left hemisphere controls language. Left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. So if somebody comes in and they don't understand what you're saying and they have aphasia and they have a right side, they should have a right-sided weakness, that means this whole area of brain here is dysfunctional. So you've knocked out all your language centers, so you don't understand speech, that's Broca's area. You you don't, uh, sorry, you can't produce speech, that's Broca's area. You don't understand speech, that's Wernicke's area. And you've also got a dense paralysis because you've got this motor cortex. Okay? That's a left MCA stroke. Global aphasia, right hemiparesis. You're going to get a quiz on this. <laughs> All right, now, that's the left side. Left side of the brain. So people always say, well, what if you're left handed? Most left-handed people also are left hemisphere dominant, meaning their language is on the left side, okay? So when you see speech problems with aphasia, right hemiparesis, that's a big, big, large vessel, carotid MCA stroke that I can take out with a catheter. Well, I can't. My plumber, as he calls it, Gary, can take them out. Now, on the other side, the, what we call the cortical sign, okay? So the cortical sign in the left hemisphere is trouble with language, aphasia. The cortical sign on the right hemisphere is neglect. It's all of a sudden they've lost the left side of space. It's gone. And because the right hemisphere is really important for visual and spatial. So you'll see somebody in the ED, a little old lady all prim and proper, and her gown's half off. You know, and her and her, she's like exposed. And she doesn't even know. You can hold up their arm. I had a guy who was like an army ranger and he had that army signet ring. You hold up his hand. You say, whose hand is this? And he's like, it's yours. He's like, oh, you have the same ring I do. They don't even recognize their own arm. That is called neglect. So they will have a left hemiparesis and neglect. And you say, why are you here? They're like, I don't know, I'm fine. And they're all like plegic and stuff. So this is a CAT scan of the right MCA stroke. The one I showed you first here, this is a left MCA. So I'm CAT scan to fall backwards. This is left. And here, this is right. So this person would have a dense hemiparesis. This is a big stroke, right? Okay, so this is a neglect syndrome. So they only see half of space. So you can ask them to draw a clock. They miss all these numbers, okay? All right, so I'm gonna tell you a little story about, oh, I don't know if I put a picture in. Okay, so this is one of the first generation devices that we use to go take out the clocks, right? This is called the Mercy. It looks like a corkscrew. See how it's kind of stiff? I'll show you some afterwards that are kind of soft, so they don't perforate vessels. And then, so what you do is you go through the vessel, and then you let the clock kind of form around this corkscrew device, and then you pull it out. So I also like to use this case, because she doesn't mind, and it was one of the first cases we did with Mercy, I don't know, like 10 years ago. Her name's Marissa. She's awesome. She's actually a lawyer now. I'm like, don't you go into medical malpractice? <laughs> I'll regret, I'll regret. So anyway, she's a 20-year-old college student, captain of the high school, uh, college um, soccer team. I recently came from New England. She was at Mount Holyoke. She had gone to a roommate's uh, room. So this is a young girl, 20 years old, uh, to get her hair braided. And luckily, we had been up there the week before talking about aphasia and stroke. Otherwise, this girl would have gone to the ED and they would have said, she's crazy, she's drunk, she's high, whatever. 20-year-olds don't get stroke, right? They do. It's rare. So she was getting her hair braided, and all of a sudden, her right face went all droopy, and she became globally aphasic. So big, huge, devastating nursing home stroke, right? It could have been devastating. So she got the clot buster. She went to the local ER. They said, this is a stroke. This isn't a migraine. It's not drug use. It's a stroke. They gave her the clot buster, and then we flew her down to Hartford. And this is her skull x-ray. Here's her eye sockets here. And see what this is? That's the Mercy. So that's inside her middle cerebral artery, inside her head. So, And here's the catheter. So the catheter's going up, and the Mercy's been deployed. And here's her angiogram. So this is dye, this is her carotid artery, and you see right here, there's a clot. This is where her initial clot was, and then after we did the Mercy, see all these blood vessels come back? And this is what you pulled out, okay? So that's the clot that got pulled out from her. 
This is her MRI. See, it doesn't have skull around it, so this is an MRI. And this area right here is her infarct. So she went from having a stroke that would have taken up this entire hemisphere, like this, and left her globally aphasic and hemiparetic, to this small stroke. She was back to school three weeks later. So this was really a game changer. The problem with the Mercy is it was really stiff. So sometimes when you're going into these delicate vessels, we would go through it and kill people because that's an arterial bleed in the head. You can't stop it. It's down. So then the, I don't know if this will play, hopefully. Um, so this is the new device we use called Solitaire. I brought one of them. You advance past the clot. So this is the clot here. This is the device sitting in the clot here. So you put the catheter in, pass the clot, you deploy the clot, then you sit there. And you wait. And you wait. And you wait. We're not going to wait for that long. <laughs> um, so like about two to five minutes, and then you pull it back out with the clot all entangled like this. So you can see from the video, and then you just pull the clot right out. So I brought one of those to show you. So that's called the solitaire device. Okay? And it's nice and soft and flexible. Okay? So we now treat acute stroke this way. This is, what kind, is this an MRI or a CAT scan? CAT scan. Oh, look at you, gunners. Gunner. This is the gunner table. Okay, what type of, what type of stroke is this? The bleeding inside the head. Intracerebral and intracranial hemorrhage. Big, huge clot. This one, is that inside the brain? Or is it in the spaces around the brain? This is the subarachnoid. This is from an aneurysm. So here, where you see the blood inside the brain, this is more kind of in the crevices. This is all like in the cortex and the little walnut. And then there's probably a little clot here. What is this? This is an aneurysm. So this patient had, this is her angiogram. And see this right here? This is an outpouching, like a balloon. This is a cerebral aneurysm, about one in a hundred. And often fatal. So now, we used to go in and take people's heads off, if you not their heads off, that would be bad, their skull off, and go in there and clip it with a clip, like almost like a paper clip, right? Now you can go in with a catheter and put coils in here, platinum coils. So here's a catheter, and I brought some coils, but they're not working so great. Um, so you put these coils into this, and you can see after you do that, look what's happened. The aneurysm is gone. So now we can treat these aneurysms without having people have to go undergo craniotomy. So they recover much more quickly. All right, one last thing we wanted to talk about uh, as far as cases. So this is a 50-year-old guy. He has AFib, which is a little unusual, but it's a common cause of stroke, but usually more common cause in older folks. Atrial fibrillation is just when the top of the heart fibrillates. And that lets a bunch of eddy currents and clots form. And then often when you go in and out of AFib, the heart starts to contract, and where do they go? And so from the heart, they go north. So the biggest problem with AFib is its risk of stroke. So you want to use a blood thinner. So anyway, this guy had an AFib, three hours since time of onset, kind of woke up with left hemiparesystem neglect. So what blood vessel are we thinking? Which side of the brain? Left-sided weakness. Hemiparesis means weakness. So left-sided weakness means right, right side of the brain. And does that make sense with neglect? Right. right, so right hemisphere neglect. So is it a big vessel or a small vessel? Big, big vessel, right? <laughs> the cortical sign on the left hemisphere is language, aphasia. On the right is neglect. That tells me it's a big vessel, big area of brain. So he woke up, and so this is a classic, what we call right middle cerebral artery syndrome. And here, on the CAT scan, this is the clot. Okay, this is an MRA, and you can see here, there's a clot here. So here's the normal side. You can see the caliber of the vessels, and then this is abnormal. So he unfortunately woke up with his symptoms, and his first CAT scan showed edema. So we knew that his stroke was not three hours old. If it was within four and a half hours, he would have gotten a clot buster, followed by a thrombectomy for this stroke. This actually happened a couple of years ago when we weren't giving the thrombectomies. They got approved in 2016. So this is recent. So 48 hours later, he continues to have this dense left-sided weakness, and his eyes are pulling over. He's kind of on commands, but he's getting sleepy. His pupils aren't reacting. He develops anisocoria, which means unequal pupils. So what do you think is happening two days after this big stroke? What's happening to his brain? He's dying. He's dying. And what happens when things die? Everything else shuts down. Everything else. It dumps out all kinds of bad chemicals. 
and it swells. And what did I tell you about a foamy vault? It's a skull, right? There's nowhere for it to go. So what's happening? Why is he getting sleepier? Because the dead area brain is releasing lots of stuff, and it's also swelling. And it's swelling, and it's starting to compress important things, like where you breathe your eye muscles, your pupillary reactions, all your brain stem is starting to get smushed. So what are we going to do? This guy's got a lot of edema. How are we going to get it out? So this is his, um, this is an MRI, and this is a stroke. It's a big area of brain, okay? Now, this is one of his earlier scans. You can still see these little black holes. These are called ventricles. Right here, you can draw a line right down the middle. See the middle? And then you see all this dead area. This brain is probably irreversibly damaged. But there's much swelling. But look what happens when over 12 hours. So now here's the infarct. And like try and draw a line here. This whole brain has been smushed over. This is called midline shift. So I can't draw a line down the middle because this area is all dead. This dark area is now all dead brain. And it's pushing. See how it's pushing on all on the other side of the brain. So he's starting to herniate. So you can't even see his brain stem because there's so much swelling. So do we have any options for this guy? Now if you're squeamish, close your eyes for the next two minutes. Okay. So we do close your eyes. So you take the skull off. You take the skull off because that's your only choice to get rid of the pressure. We can give him mannitol, we can give him salts to try and dry out the brain. It doesn't work. Um, not with a big stroke. So here you can see, here's his pre brain stem, here's his CAT scan, here's all his skull. This is all dead brain, including the basal ganglia. Big, big stroke. Everything's shifted over. You try and draw a midline. About a third of the brain that's supposed to be on this side is on the other side. Do you guys see that? It's bad. So you go into the OR. Here's his head, and you mark off what you take off, and you take off the skull. And here is the brain after you've removed that skull. You can see there's a lot of venous engorgement here, and the brain's kind of poking out because it's under so much pressure. So here's the ridge of his skull. This is called a hemicraniac hemicraniacomy, and you have to do it big enough because you don't want to make a small hole because then it kind of like mushrooms out, like a Play-Doh. That's really bad. So we learned to make them very big. Um, this is the dura, the covering of the brain, kind of folded back, and then this is the brain itself. So this is a life-saving procedure. Then you put on a flap. This is an intracranial pressure monitoring, which basically will drain fluid and monitor pressure. And then that's a bunch of stitches. And then here's his CAT scan before. So this is the one where everything's smushed over. Now look, look what's happening. The brain's all moved back over to this side. This is his skull reflex. So this is the part of the skull that he's missing. But you can see how it's changed how much edema he has. You guys see that? So here's he's herniating, everything's smushing over, all this brain stem here, midbrain's getting compressed. Now that's all decompressed because the brain has been allowed to herniate outwards. These people usually have a week or two and then you put them on a helmet because you do not want these people to fall. Because if they fall, they're going to bleed because there's no protection. You can feel their brain. It's like foggy and stuff. Anyway, so then about anywhere between three to six months later, you can put the bone, the skull itself, in the bone bank, or some, sometimes in the patient's abdomen. Actually, it stays just fine there. And then three or three months later, you go back in and you put it back on and, you know, sew it back up. Actually, and he drove to clinic, and it's a right MCA, so he had no language problems. He could follow commands, and he walked on a forepaw, but he drove himself to clinic. This was a lifetime stroke. He was dying. He was going to die. So hemicraniectomy is now indicated for people under 60. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about research in the last few minutes because I don't think I have too much time, right? Ten. We have five minutes. Perfect. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Twenty minutes. Okay. I don't want to stop me because I will just talk and talk and talk. Um, so I do a lot of basic science research. I brought some rat and mouse brains so you can see the vessels on them and see the size of them. Um, but the problem with using animals in basic science research is I can model stroke and I can put these little sutures up or I can tie it off or I can, you know, we use a laser to kind of ablate the vessel and we do all kinds of different things. But most of our animals are not like smoking and eating at McDonald's <laughs> and having high cholesterol. You can knock, you can do a thing called knocking in these genetic things. Like, so mice don't get amyloid. So they're, you have to knock in genes to make them have Alzheimer's. 
So in stroke, what are the big risk factors for stroke? I showed you Marissa in the beginning. She's young, 20. But the vast majority of stroke patients are over 65. How often do we use old mice? No. We use 8 to 10 to 12 week mice. Those are three months old, so I'm modeling stroke in a 12 year old. That doesn't make much sense. So I actually use all aged animals, but we've now gone from paying you know, $20 a mouse to paying $385 a mouse. So it's very expensive to do these studies. So sometimes we'll do young animals to validate and then use aged animals. Um, so one of the issues in how we haven't been able to translate a lot of therapies that were great in the lab, we can cure, we cured mouse stroke like 10 years ago. Unfortunately, <laughs> we're not doing so well with human stroke. So these are some brains, and when I pass them around, you'll get to see them. So what we use is uh, a what we call middle cerebral artery model, because that is the most common stroke, the one I showed you. Um, so you take, sorry, I don't know why that's coming up. There's a um, suture, and you just feed it up through the ventral surface of the mouse, and you put the end of the suture right here, and you block off this area, and it causes a stroke. So I'll show you a stroke brain. This is... Um, uh, animal that's been injected with a leptin dye, which is like, will cast out vessels. So this is the normal MCA, and this, see how this side didn't have any vessels? That's because there's a suture right here. So here's the left MCA with all its vessels. We put a suture up here, and we block the blood flow. So it works pretty well. And it gives us, here's a CAT scan of a patient, it gives us a pretty good approximate approximation of the damage that we see. This is what we call a TTC stain. I bought a few of those. This is just a vital dye that's picked up by mitochondria. And when mitochondria respire, they turn it pink. So when you see white areas, that's bad brain. That's brain that doesn't have normally functioning mitochondria. It's dead brain. The pink brain is normal because the mitochondria are respiring. They can pick up the dye, turn it to pink. So this is about an hour and a half after we do that suture. And what you can see is the stroke, just like in humans, grows over time. It's about 24 to, 24 to 3 days. And then you get this kind of wedge-shaped infarct, very similar to what we see in patients. We do know using aged animals is much better. So we found things that work great in young animals. Now we've gone back and tried them in aged animals that don't work at all. So that might be part of the problem is why we're having trouble. Another thing that's very kind of unique to aged animals and aged patients, the biggest risk factor for that clot buster is bleeding inside the head. Well, what's the biggest risk factor for bleeding inside the head? Age. So similar in the lab, we almost never see this, this hemorrhage. See this brown gunk? This is hemorrhage. And if you cut the brain, you can see that there's bleeding inside the brain here. And we almost never see that in a young animal. We see it. 50% of the time in an old animal. And it has to do with a very complicated immune thing. We've kind of figured it out by giving young bone marrow transplants to aged animals, and they don't have this. So if you put the young bone marrow into an aged animal, even though their brain is aged and their blood vessels are aged, <laughs> the young bone marrow protects the aged brain. If you put aged bone marrow into young animals, they start bleeding. So it's something to do with the peripheral immune system. We just have we use a bit, bunch of different animal models. Uh, this is called a cylinder test. This is an animal, and mice just tend to explore. So the rear up, this animal has an anaphylaxis. This arm is normal. This paw is normal. See how his other paw is kind of down? So we can count the number of presses that he presses on the cylinder. Like I was talking about with the immune system, we have a very large kind of program in the lab to try and figure out what causes the detrimental effects of stroke. We now know stroke is a systemic disease. If you give an animal a stroke, the spleen contracts by 50% because it dumps out all its immune cells. And guess what? That happens in humans as well. So if you ultrasound the spleen, it contracts. This is a stroke, um, a sham and a stroke thymus, which is where T cells are. And this is a sham and a stroke spleen. However, in an aged animal, this is a young animal that doesn't have a stroke. You give it a stroke and the thymus goes off. Oh. But aged animals don't have a thymus. Aged people don't have a thymus. It just involutes as you get older because you don't have that many T cells anymore. So we started looking at other parts of the body that could affect stroke. This is just a blood outer plate. And this is always a cool thing for science kids. Like these are pretty cheap. And you can actually have like um, them do like swab their noses. And this is a colony forming unit. So this is an 
agar, which is just kind of like gelatin with some blood in it to nourish bacteria. And what we did is we took the mesenteric lymph nodes, which are the draining lymph nodes of the gut in the GI tract. And we found that in an aging animal, see all these little dots? Those are all colony forming units. They're all little bacterial colonies. So in a young animal, you see one or two. In an aging animal, see how many you have? And we were trying to figure out, well, why do they have so many more colony forming units? The aged animals not just bleed, they die. What are they dying of? They die of infections. So we looked at these mesenteric lymph nodes, we found these colony forming units, and then we actually did 16S and did some sequencing on them to find out what the colonies were. And we found that the aged and young uh, bacteria in these mesenteric lymph nodes were completely different. So why do age have different bacteria? Where is this bacteria coming from? Turns out when you give a stroke, not only does the spleen contract, the gut gets all leaky. The gut loses its hypoxic barrier, and the things called the commensals, those are the bacteria that live in our gut. It's also called the microbiome. You may have heard of the microbiome, all these probiotics. We are outnumbered 10 million, 100 million to one by bacterial cells. Bacteria live in our gut. They're commensal. They make things that we need and mammals can't make, like short-chain fatty acids. So if you have something called dysbiosis, the gut starts not working properly. Stroke induces dysbiosis. So now we found that when we give a stroke, the gut population of commensals completely changes to things that are pretty symbiotic and helpful, to things that are a little pathogenic. And when you give a stroke, the gut gets leaky, and these pathogenic bacteria can then get out. And that's what we were finding in the mesenteric lymph nodes. So here is uh, some guts of young and aged mice. This is the outside of the gut. So the gut, think of it as a cylinder. We gavage them with Fitzy, which is a fluorescent dye. So we just basically take a little, a little gavage needle and feed them this Fitzy. And after a couple hours, you can assess gut leakage. So in young animals here, you can see a little bit of leakage, but most of the Fitzy stays inside. In aged animals, see how it all leaks out? And if you look at the lumen of the gut, this is the mucus layer. This is a healthy, healthy looking gut. It has mucus that the bacteria can't get through. This is our, this is host, and this is bacteria. When you get aged, look what happens. Your architecture starts to deteriorate, and you don't have that nice mucus layer. Look what happens in stroke. Oh, look out, that looks horrible. There's no ischemia to the gut. But why does it look like this? We don't know. Probably sympathetic nervous system and autonomic nervous system. This is a normal looking gut. This is the lumen of the gut where all the bacteria are. And this is, you know, per, you know, lamina propria. And this is host, right? So this part's host, this part's bacteria. This is a hypoxic barrier. This is a hypoxic dye, this green. Look what happens in stroke. There's no longer any hypoxic barrier, and you start to lose the architecture. So those bacteria can come right on out of the gut. Okay? We found that these differences are completely mediated by age. So these are the commensals, and well, they're not commensals, they're a little patho pathogenic, that live in the age biome, and these are the ones that live in the young biome. This is in mice. So these are the same strain, same C57 black mice. They eat the same chow, they live in the same cages, yet the aged and young animals have completely different bacteria. So the host factors can tell you which bacteria can survive in the gut. The ones that are surviving the aged animals, just like in aged humans, because now we're doing this in humans, are dysbiotic and more pathogenic. Recently they found the most common cause of death in a stroke patient, except for those big strokes where you herniate, is infection. Especially as you get older, you know, they get a pneumonia. Turns out those bugs are not oral bugs or, or lung bugs. They're gut bugs. So they're coming out and they're seeding the patient and they're causing the pneumonia. So we have to think about how we can treat them. I mean, we've done that in a bunch of different ways. So I just wanted to acknowledge some of the people that did a lot of the science in the last couple of minutes. And this is um, some of my postdocs. Rodney did a lot of the age bone marrow stuff, and I didn't show a lot of this. These are four, uh, four MDPHDs that are in my lab. And this is the guy who did a lot of the biome stuff who's now doing the MDPHD at Case Western. So we have support from American Heart and NIH. It's never enough. <laughs> so feel free to donate. Oh wait, yeah, this is for philanthropy lecture. <laughs> All right, so that's it. Thank you.